G'day, Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series. And today what I thought we'd have a chat about is the humble Series 1 Land Rover. Now, the different variations of this particular vehicle have been given a huge amount of hype over the last five years or so. And what I thought I'd share with you is some of the tips, some of the tricks, and some of the hidden features that Damon and myself have found by working on these vehicles over a number of, number of years and some of the key things that you need to look out for if you're looking at buying or wish to buy a Land Rover Series 1. So if you want to find out this and more then you know what to do. Click on that subscribe button down below, click on that notification button too but most importantly stay tuned. Series 1 Land Rover is really genesis when it comes to any Land Rover collector or any Land Rover enthusiast. And as many of you know, it only really became the Series 1 Land Rover because of its overall success. And in 1958, it got a little bit of a revamp and became the Series 2. Nowadays though, the Series 1 Land Rover is becoming incredibly desirable amongst collectors and Land Rover enthusiasts. And the overall price of these vehicles has skyrocketed. I myself am very lucky to own a 1951 80-inch Land Rover Series 1, which I paid $400 for uh, a bit over 10 years ago. But Nowadays, if I were going to sell the same vehicle, I could get anywhere between $4,000 to $12,000 Australian, having done no work on it at all, not even driven it on the occasional Sunday. And it's very much the same for this vehicle here. And though these vehicles are fantastic, they were very revolutionary when they came out, there's some key things that you need to look out for if you're wanting to actually buy one of these vehicles and potentially restore it yourself or get someone else to restore it for you. And that's what we're going to obviously start off looking at here today. Now, this one here is quite unique. It's got a lot of interesting features on it and I'm going to run through those with you. Now, in particular, the first thing you want to look at if you're looking on car sales, Gumtree or wherever it may be, is the front grille. The front grille, or this panel here, actually says a lot. Because where it's actually located will give you a rough idea whether the actual engine itself has been modified. Now as we can see here with the overall, I guess, contour of the bonnet, it's pretty much flush with the radiator panel here. Now, that's obviously going to be very important to note later on in the video, so stay tuned as always. This Land Rover here is, as I said, an 86 inch, and the panel here is actually made out of tin or steel, and these are notorious for rusting along the bottom, so that's one of the things you want to look out for there. One of the other things that needs to be kept in mind is particularly the alloy that was used in the Series 1 Land Rover and the fact that these vehicles are getting beyond 70 years of age, there tends to actually be a fair amount of uh, electrolysis in the actual panels themselves, and this can actually cause for holes to actually occur where the actual mirrors themselves bolt in, because obviously people have used steel bolts in there over the years, and that obviously degrades the overall integrity of the alloy. The other thing you want to keep in mind is where are you buying the vehicle from? If it's a rel relatively dry environment, it's not so bad. But here in Tasmania, where these vehicles are wet for 99% of the year, electrolysis is a real, real problem. 
and this can basically just rot the alloy and trying to actually bring these panels back to life can be incredibly difficult. But anyway, I'll bring you in a bit closer, we'll open up the bonnet and I'll discuss some of the engine conversions that you yourself might come up against when looking for that ideal Series 1. So as I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, in regards to the panel here that holds the radiator in place, looking at where it's actually located in regards to the bonnet, gives you a good indication as to the motor that might be fitted. Now here in Australia a very po popular conversion was of obviously putting a GM motor in of some kind or a Holden engine and this one is a prime example of that. Now it depends on how original you want the vehicle to be. These conversions work really really well. Uh, Damon and myself have travelled the length and breadth of Tasmania in his Series, th series 3 Land Rover which actually has a 202 in it and it works perfectly fine. But if you are looking at keeping, I guess, the conversion in your Series 1 Land Rover, you really need to pay attention to the front cross member of the chassis. This will tell you a lot about how much time and effort has been put into doing a conversion of this nature. Because I've seen good ones and I've seen bad ones and to give you an idea of what a bad one is if they literally cut the top of the cross member off they cut one side down so you can fit the radiator in and they drill a hole through the bottom so you can get the tap of the radiator through so then you can obviously let the coolant out and this one here isn't a bad conversion they've actually welded in a couple of plates and finished it off quite nicely so that's something to keep in mind. There's other conversions and other modifications that people did, uh, particularly in regards to the Rover Saloons, which came out with the same engine, essentially, the 1.6 and later the 2-litre engine. And people would actually fit the cylinder head off the Rover Saloon onto the Series 1 block. And the key advantage with this was that it was a alloy head, which wasn't much of an advantage, but it meant that you could fit a SU carburetor on it, most likely a HS6. And by doing that, you could more finely tune the engine, and it is said that you could get an extra 20 horsepower actually out of the engine itself. So that's something also worth to note. As I've said earlier, it depends on how original you want the vehicle to be. There was a lot of good things about these vehicles, but there was a lot of bad things about these vehicles. And I'll show you a prime example of that towards the rear of the vehicle. Rightio, so we're here at the rear of the vehicle, and one of the popular sort of, I guess, conversions or modifications that was done back in the day was upgrading the axles. Now, the Series 1 Land Rover was pretty much exactly the same in regards to the Series 2. It was notorious for snapping axles. The axle assembly in these was pretty much exactly the same as what was used in the Rover Saloon. And so to give it, I guess, a little bit more punch, people used to take out the semi-floating axle which is in here, and they would actually fit the fully floating axle out of the Land Rover Series 2. But there was a problem. The actual wheelbase of the 80 and the 86 inch is slightly different to the Series 2. The Series 2 is actually probably a few millimetres, if not a quarter of an inch, wider at the front and the rear. So to accommodate the fully floating axles into the actual Series 1 axle housing, which is what you have to use, you actually had to use distance pieces or spaces between the actual stub axle and the actual drive flange of the axle. Now, once again, it depends on how original you want the vehicle to be. Personally, if I saw that, and I saw, as I mentioned earlier, the cylinder head conversion, I would actually keep it, because that's an interesting part of the car's heritage or history. But if you want to go purely pure, at making it a showpiece, then obviously that's something that might steer you away from purchasing that vehicle. Rightio, so we've talked about the engine bay, we've talked about the rear of the vehicle, and now
now it's time to delve inside. And the great thing about these vehicles is they're incredibly easy to do so. So let's get in there. Okay, so the interior of these vehicles is a bit comical because it's as minimalist as it can possibly get. This one here, someone's had the bright idea of fitting a bus seat into it, which is something that could potentially turn you off because the seats that fit here, which are made out of a elephant hide like material, are incredibly expensive. And this is really probably the most expensive part of the whole vehicle. If you've got an 80 inch and you're looking at buying a horn center with the actual dash not dash, sorry, the actual dip switch incorporated in it, you can pretty much spend up to $800 Australian, which is a lot of money. Other things such as gauges vary throughout the different variations of the Series 1. This one being a 80... <laughs> this one being an 86 inch was built after 1954, so it's got the larger Smith gauges each side. So we've got a speedo here, we've then got our fuel and amp gauge, which is exactly the same as what you get in the Series 2 Land Rover. And by Series 2 I'm referring from 1958 to 1961-62. So they're, they're incredibly hard to get and that's one of the things that you really want to make sure that you've got. Getting a good, I'll just get the clutch gear stick out of the way. Getting a good ignition switch is also very important. You can get the modern equivalents, but the internals of them are actually filled with plastic. And if you're going for an original, I guess, wiring loom, you're getting a lot of current going through your switches. Now, the problem with that is, by now using plastic components, and I've had this happen to me, they can somehow become fused and become one which means the switch doesn't work anymore. So keeping original switches, keeping original dials is really, really important. Now, there's other things obviously to look at. And one of the things that I haven't talked about is obviously the body panels. And sadly, this vehicle has got a lot of cancer, rust. And this is really one of the key killers, particularly in wetter environments such as the UK and here in Tasmania. Getting a vehicle with as minimal amount of rust in it is really the best place to start. And you really need to dig a little bit deeper if you're serious about buying one of these vehicles. The best thing to do is taking a long flat bladed screwdriver and if the owner isn't too precious about it, having a little bit of poke around. Because the footwell each side here looks fantastic. It looks as good nearly as when it came out of the factory but I can tell that it's got more fiberglass than a rip curl surfboard and that's not a good thing. The dash itself is also rusted pretty badly in places so you've then got to think about how good are you with a MIG or TIG welder. One of the other electrical components that, or two electrical components that you need to look out for is obviously your indicator unit these are quite hard to get and also making sure that you've got a Lucas windscreen wiper motor. Now these motors too you want to check for the actual slop within the motor itself because there is a dog clutch in there. If the slop's quite not too bad then obviously you've got a good motor otherwise you're going to have to look at stripping it apart you're going to have to build up the braze on that actual dog clutch unit to ensure you haven't got the slop within it because the more slop you get, the less arc you actually get out of the windscreen wiper itself. And basically it gets to a point where it's ineffective. So that's probably everything to talk about here. I'll, I know I haven't mentioned everything, but we'd be here for many, many months if I did. But we'll uh, move on to the chassis and we'll have a little bit of a chat about that. Now, what I'm about to tell you here pretty much applies to any Land Rover built from 1948 up until 2016 and that is the the backbone the chassis when you're looking at any of these vehicles what you want to look at is the rear cross member this is where a lot of the grief occurs it's not where all the grief occurs but a lot of it 
at first glance, and you can do this just with photos online, you want to see, particularly like here, if there's been any plates actually welded into the chassis rail itself. The rear cross member, which is this, suffers a lot because we've got the rear wheels, mud sits up on top, mud gets caught up underneath, and it just rots the chassis itself away. Now this isn't too bad in regards to the Series 2 and the Series 3 and the Defender. You can buy kits for next to nothing to repair them. But with the earlier Series 1 Land Rovers, like this 86 inch here, it's getting harder and harder to get these kits. And it comes down to, or comes to the point of, do you want to keep the chassis, keep as much of the original vehicle as possible? Or do you just want to replace the whole thing and obviously give your checkbook to someone and get a full galvanized chassis? So that's something you need to consider. You know, how original do you want the vehicle to be? And I know I've said that before, but it is a real contentious issue when it comes to these vehicles. So obviously the places that you want to look is obviously on the outer wings either side. They particularly rust in here. Underneath, you just want to have a quick feel and see what the condition's like there. And particularly with these vehicles, uh, as an optional extra, you could get a towing plate that would go underneath. Now, this was quite good, but the problem is it literally bolts straight underneath the chassis. And there's actually, I can feel there's a bolt hole there, and there are bolt holes underneath. The problem is because this is a flat plate steel bolted onto the bottom of the chassis is moisture, dirt and mud collects there and over 70 odd years it can slowly rust out and it can actually rust out the bottom of the chassis itself. So once again the best thing you can invest in is a good MIG and TIG welder and obviously know how to use it. Anyway we'll return to the front of the vehicle and we'll leave it there. So I know I haven't covered everything in this video in regards to buying a Land Rover Series 1. And as I said, if we were going to do that, we'd be here for a month of Sundays. But anyway, hopefully there's a few things for you to think about in regards to buying a Series 1 Land Rover or potentially toying with the idea of getting a Series 1 Land Rover. But anyway, Thanks for stopping by, thanks for watching this video, and look, if you are enjoying the content here at Seriously Series, then please do consider supporting us via Patreon. All proceeds go to generating these videos and a heck of a lot more. And if you're new to the channel, then please click on that subscribe button down below. Please click on that notification button too, and that way you won't miss out on one single video. Anyway, I hope to see you in our next video.